right, so welcome to Landscaping for Clean Water, everybody. We are here tonight to talk about how we can all make a difference for clean water and water quality in Dakota County. Um, water is kind of a core value for a lot of Minnesotans, a lot of people around the country and around the world, I'd say. But here in Minnesota, we really think about our water bodies as part of our identity often. Um, how many people go up north or go to a body of water to recreate? or maybe paddlers or swimmers. Wow, that's almost everybody in the room. Awesome. Um, yes, I do too. I grew up going to lakes all the time. It's really wonderful to me that I get to spend time at my job talking about clean water. Um, and we even made the cover of Time magazine back in the 70s with Governor Wendell Anderson talking about the good life in Minnesota and how clearly that is tied to our lakes and our rivers. A more recent governor, um, and I need a quote from our newest governor now, but um, our outgoing governor, Governor Mark Dayton, said, clean, safe water is nothing we can take for granted. It is something we should insist upon and take the actions necessary to sustain it. And tonight is all about how we can take those actions to attain clean water in our neighborhoods and in the state of Minnesota. Um, here in Minnesota, we are positioned really well to have a big impact on water quality because water does not flow into our state. Water leaves our state and goes elsewhere. We are, contain three different watersheds. So if you live up north, your water is going to flow out to the Arctic Ocean. Or if you're over in more of the Arrowhead region, your water flows out the St. Lawrence Seaway all the way out to the Atlantic Ocean. And then the bulk of the state and here where we live we're in the Mississippi River watershed, which means our water, maybe first it goes to the Vermilion River, but eventually it's going to end up in the Mississippi, flow all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. So here in Minnesota, we have an enormous power to affect water, not only in our neighborhoods, but all over the country. And we have a really long history with water issues, not only here, but all over the United States. Back in the 30s, when we started heavily industrializing, uh, there were no regulations on what could and could not be dumped straight into bodies of water. So big factories, big mills, they could just dump their waste into the water without doing anything, treating or filtering in any way. Then in the 50s, and when we started industrializing agriculture, doing large-scale commercial farms, started using a lot more fertilizers, adding more nutrients to those fields, doing more heavy duty tilling and things like that. That resulted in more soil, sediments, nutrients getting added to our rivers. In the late 60s, rivers started catching on fire, uh, which was a pretty good wake up call to people. Oh, rivers are on fire. That's a sign that something's a little weird and maybe we need to take some kind of action. The Cuyahoga River was the big one that people really took note of. So that kind of directly resulted in some new legislation. And in 1972, we got the Clean Water Act, the final version, which we still use today as our main governing body of legislation in this country, regulating what you can and cannot put directly into public waters. That made a huge difference. Waters are way cleaner than they were in the 70s. But as you guys probably know, that does not mean that all water everywhere is now perfectly pristine. There is still a lot of impaired waterways in Minnesota, around Dakota County, and still things that we can do to improve those. A lot of that legislation deals with what can and cannot be done on big public lands, what big factories and big developments can do. But there's not a lot of talk of what we can all do as private homeowners, private residents in our little yards, what we can do to impact water quality. But private land, residential land, is a huge percentage of Minnesota, a huge percentage of Dakota County, which means that collectively we can make a really big impact on our water and what stuff is leaving our yards and entering that water supply. So our goal with the Landscaping for Clean Water program is to make it really easy for people to take action on their yards to do that. You guys maybe did not know that you were entering into a whole program when you started listening to this presentation tonight, but you have the option to continue on this Landscaping for Clean Water pathway. So right now, you are hearing an introduction presentation. We're going to introduce 
the concept of native gardens, rain gardens, shoreline restorations, and how all of those can contribute to water quality. After you hear the intro presentation, you are welcome to attend a design course. And every spring and summer, we offer 10 design courses around the Dakota County, the northern part of Dakota County. And that's four hours of instruction where you work one-on-one -on -one with experts to remotely design a project on your yard. Whether that's a rain garden, a native garden, a shoreline project, stabilizing a really steep slope that's eroding, whatever kind of issue you want to do in your yard. We'll work with you. We'll work with maps of your property. If you attend a design course, you are eligible to apply for a grant. And one of the things the grants come with is site visits. So we'll start by coming out to your yard. We'll look at the reality of your yard. We'll help you lay it out. We'll paint it out on your grass, do some, leave some measurements for you, answer your questions. We'll come back halfway through to check and make sure everything's on the right track. And once the project is done, you'll also receive a $250 reimbursement for that rain garden, native garden, shoreline project, um, whatever it might be. And throughout that whole process, we're always there to answer questions. Even if you don't go through that whole process, that's what the Soil and Water Conservation District is for, is to help answer your questions about your yard, about pollinators, about plants, about drainage, about anything that affects soil and water in your neighborhood. So the three big projects that we encourage are native gardens, rain gardens, and shorelines. We're going to talk about each of those briefly. Um, Native gardens are a garden that consists entirely of plants that are native to Dakota County. They were here before people came here. They were not introduced by human settlers. Um, this is a Marshner map. So F.J. Marshner never actually set foot in Minnesota, but he looked at really detailed notes brought back from early explorers from Europe, and he looked back at the pressed flowers and plant clippings and things that they brought back. And he created this detailed map of the three major vegetation communities in the state. Um, and you can see there's kind of some big groupings here. So up in the north, northeastern area, it's kind of that boreal, coniferous forest, lots of spruces. Um, in the middle band is our deciduous forest, lots of big broadleaf trees, oaks and maples. And then that yellowy, cream-colored is the prairie. Um, and then there's different native plant communities scattered throughout there as well. So these native plant communities, these are the four main ones that were found in the seven county metro area. And we're down there in Dakota County. Right now we are near that red star. And big woods, oak openings, prairie, and wet meadow or a wetland is what this whole area around here would have looked like before European settlers came here. Um, there we go. Um, so pictures, picture it kind of like this. And you guys have probably walked through, visited, camped in, you know, Lebanon Hills nearby has a lot of ecosystems that still kind of look like this. Um, but right where we're watching this from now, this whole area would have looked maybe kind of like this. Big canopy trees, lots of undergrowth. Um, little streams and wetlands interspersed in there. So these are the native plant communities. I'm losing it. Uh, the native plant communities that used to exist in the metro area. And this is what remains of them now. So those purple dots are the areas where we still have intact entire plant communities with a diversity of species that evolved together. All of that white space is landscape that has been changed by people. It's been paved, it's been drained, it's been regraded, it's been planted with turf grass or street trees, um, it's got buildings on it. So our goal in this program is to just add a few more purple dots, to make all of you add a purple dot to that map. We don't want to turn it all purple again, right? We live here, we need space for our things too. But if we can create corridors and stepping stones, that's great for the native birds and the native pollinators that can then easily move from one food source and one home to another as they're migrating, as they're living here throughout the seasons. Um, we just want to create a little bit more of a, of a connected network 
of those native plants. When you go to the plant store or are looking at plants, um, it's easy to get confused between the native plants and then cultivars of the native plants. So up here, we've got Rudbeckia herta, which is also known as, probably known as black-eyed Susan, a pretty common native plant to see around these parts. Um, and over on the right, there is some cultivars of that. So this is the Prairie Sun cultivar. You can see that nickname, the Moreno cultivar and the Maya cultivar. There are dozens of other cultivars too. They're the same species, but they've been bred for certain traits. They've been um, cultivated for certain traits. So native plants, they historically grew here. They're adapted to our climate. They're adapted to our soils. Um, they don't need a lot of inputs because of that. So we don't have to, you really don't have to water them once they're established. You don't have to provide fertilizers. They're in balance with the local herbivores and pests. Um, they're part of this community. They're providing food and shelter for wildlife, birds, pollinators, and our native plants in this area have very deep roots, which is helping to keep our soils uncompacted, helping water infiltrate. Cultivars, cultivar stands for a cultivated variety. They're bred from a native plant, but certain traits have been selected for, and usually those are really big flowers or different colors or patterns of flowers or flowers that last longer, so they bloom for four months instead of two months. Um, but typically, when you're selecting for those traits, you're losing other traits. So the plant is spending more of its nutrients and sugars producing lots of petals or uh, producing really long-lasting flowers. And it, so as a result, it's not devoting those resources to building deep roots or to producing nectar or to producing seeds. So typically cultivars have very reduced nectar production. Often they are not producing seeds at all, so no food for birds. Um, and they have much shallower root systems than the non-cultivated native species. So they have other benefits, and you can certainly mix them in and get that benefit of the bright color. But if you're not planting native plants also, then you're losing out on some of those additional benefits. I don't know why my clicker is being so slow. Um, so native plants can come in a wide, you know, there's a ton of sizes, heights, colors, and they're all providing unique benefits for different species. You guys um, are maybe familiar with milkweed and how important it is for our monarch butterflies. Uh, milkweed is the only thing that monarch butterfly caterpillars can eat. If they can't find a milkweed plant, they won't have any food. So that's very crucial. There's a few different milkweed species. Milkweed plants actually have a little bit of toxin in them, which the, is, doesn't affect the monarchs, but they absorb that toxin into their bodies. And later, as adult butterflies, they are toxic to anything that might want to eat them. So it's a really good defense mechanism. Animals that eat butterflies learn to recognize that orange and black pattern and avoid monarchs because they know it'll make them sick. As adults, the monarch butterflies can eat any kind of native wildflower, flowering species, but if they can't find a native wildflower producing a lot of nectar, they won't be able to get enough of those valuable sugars. There's other native plants that all provide their own unique benefits. So oxeye sunflower is crucial for our native bees, which pollinate all of our crops here in Minnesota. Turtle head is the only thing that this native checker spot butterfly can eat. Purple cone flower is a really important late season food source with those seed heads on the flower. And same with blue false indigo, which produces these really gorgeous seed pods that last into the winter. Um, and can also be used as a pretty fun little musical instrument. They're like a little rattle. Um, so a lot of different benefits depending on which plant you're looking at. The other nice thing about a lot of the native plants around here is that they have adapted to grow under the thick canopy of big shade trees. So does anyone have a spot in your yard where nothing will grow because it's very shady? Yes, yeah, me too. I see lots of hands. Um, Native plants are the perfect solution to that. So things like mayapple or different kinds of native ferns, they'll fill in a space. They'll make it look nice and green. You don't have to mow it or maintain it. And they're very, very happy without sunlight. Um, 
So easy to take care of. And it's also going to prevent the soil in that part of your yard from washing away every time it rains, uh, which is great for the water nearby. We really recommend, too, um, combining native plants with your existing landscaping or with your other favorite flowers. I think a lot of people sometimes hear native planting and they think, oh, they want me to turn my whole yard into a giant prairie. Um, but it, you, know, you can do that if you want to do that. But you can also just incorporate little pockets of native plants into your existing landscaping or combine them with your favorite cultivars or your favorite annuals that might have a, a, a bigger variety of your favorite color. Um, having those little pockets, little bunches of flowers is going to provide that benefit for those butterflies. You don't have to go all or nothing with them. We talked a little bit about the roots already, but these are some of the plants that are native to this area. Um, and you can see that their roots can be up to 15 feet deep. Um, so all of those little root tendrils are loosening the soil. They're creating new pathways for water and microorganisms to move through the dirt. Um, over time, parts of the root system will die off as other parts grow, and so that's leaving empty channels uh, so that over time, the ability of the ground to soak up that water is just getting better and better and better every year. Meanwhile, you maybe did not notice lone little turf grass over there in the corner. Our little lawn grass is inches about two inches deep. So it is providing some water infiltration benefits for those top two inches, and then its benefits kind of cease. So those native plants are helping us out a lot more. Same thing on the left there, there's some non-native cultivars. You can see that the cultivated variety also better than lawn grass, but still has shallower roots than the native prairie plants there. That picture just blows me away every time. Look at the mass of roots on that little plant there. It's a tuft of grass. So there are different places to buy native plants. Every year, the city of Burnsville has a great native plant market. You can also find native plants at all of the big box stores, like Gertens, Bachmann's, things like that. And there's also a wide variety of uh, people that specialize in native plants only. Um, and that makes it really easy. You can go there. You don't have to read the tag or do your homework. You know that it's all native plant species. And you can contact our office if you want a list of those native plant suppliers. We also give those out and talk about that a lot in the design course, too. Um, so lots of options for finding native plants to add to your yard. A lot of them will deliver. A lot of them will give discounts for buying in bulk also. So we're going to talk about rain gardens. Anyone have a, need a clarifying question or anything about native gardens? So a rain garden, which could also be a native garden, you could fill your rain garden with entirely native plants, and then it would kind of fit into both of these categories. But a rain garden is going to provide additional benefits for local water quality, besides just helping that water recharge our groundwater by soaking in. Here is a screenshot of an area up in the Boundary Waters, actually, where we have 100% natural cover. And this means that there's no impervious surfaces. An impervious surface would be pavement, a roof, a place where when rain hits, it can't soak in. So in a landscape like this, when it rains, some of the water is still going to run off. About 10% is going to run off into the nearest stream or lake before it can soak in. About 40% of that rainfall is going to get taken up by the trees. And then about 50% of the rain is going to infiltrate and recharge the groundwater aquifers. If we flip to a landscape that looks more like the northern part of Dakota County, where we've got some, you know, still some lakes, some ponds, still a fair amount of green space in terms of yards and parks, but now we also have more impervious surface. So 25 to 50 percent of the landscape is roofs or pavements, roads, parking lots, things like that. So in a landscape like this, when it rains, we're going to have three times as much runoff. So now about 30% of the rainfall is just hitting something it can't soak in, running off into the nearest storm drain or lake or pond. 35% is still getting taken up by plants. And that means only about 35% instead of 50% is recharging our groundwater. And all of that runoff that's not getting taken up by plants 
is carrying with it sediments, soils, pollutants into the water. Um, soil is a pollutant that we often forget about, but soil particles are bound up with phosphorus, which is a nutrient that can cause huge blooms of algae um, and create big growths of nasty stuff that we don't want growing in our lakes and ponds. So those bare spots with soil that then gets washed away can actually be a huge addition of pollution to our local water. The impervious surfaces are kind of added to with new development because usually when we're building new houses or building new buildings, we're bringing in a lot of heavy equipment which is really compacting those soils. And compacted soils have a much lower ability to soak up water. So sand, if it's not compacted, can soak up 13 inches of rain an hour. If it's been compacted by heavy machinery, that drops to one and a half inches an hour. And that effect can last for decades. Clay is even worse. Uh, we think of clay as not being able to absorb much water, but if it's non-compacted, it can actually take up to 9.8 inches per hour. Compacted clay is only going to be able to absorb a quarter inch of rain every hour. So a huge difference. It's acting almost the same as pavement. Every property, no matter how big or small, can affect that stormwater runoff. So if we take this property here, uh, we'll say this is a 1,500 square foot house. So in one one inch rainfall, where we get an inch of rain over the course of the event, that's going to be 925 gallons of water leaving the house, leaving the downspouts if it has downspouts, heading out to the street and then to the storm drain. The driveway, that's going to add an additional 617 gallons. And then the yard, which is going to absorb some water, but again, not all of it. Some of it's still going to run off before it can soak in. That yard is an additional 3,880 gallons of runoff, if we say it's a 8,300 square foot yard. So in one one-inch rain event, that's 5,422 gallons of water leaving this property and going down the storm drain. Over the course of a year, if we look at the annual average precipitation here in this area, that's about 170,000 gallons of water entering that storm drain. And taking with it everything it washed off the driveway and the roof and your yard, all the soil and leaves and roof particles and the stuff that leaked out of your car into the driveway, all of that stuff. Our cities and our neighborhoods are designed to collect water, concentrate it in one area, and get it out of there, which is good because we don't want our houses, our foundations, sitting in ponds of water forever. We do want to get that water out of there, especially when we have snow melt and big rain events. Um, but the issue is that it's all getting washed straight into the storm drain in big quantities all at once. So it's picking up all of that stuff along the street, all the exhaust stuff and everything from the cars, um, and it's getting washed directly into that storm drain, where it is then piped directly to the nearest wetland, lake, or stream. And that stuff, of course, is not treated or filtered, right? It's going directly there. We have a very technical term in the water quality business for that pile of stuff, which is <laughs> gunk. Uh, it's a mixture of garbage and junk. It's the really gross stuff that's going right into our water. Um, I mentioned phosphorus. One pound of phosphorus can lead to 500 new pounds of algae. Algae is not very heavy, so if you think about that, that is a massive quantity of algae, which blocks sunlight from getting through the water, which means the underwater vegetation, the native uh, aquatic plants aren't able to grow. Um, as the algae goes through its natural life cycle, it dies off, it's decomposing, sucks up all the dissolved oxygen in the water, so then you get massive fish die-offs. And algae can also be really toxic, too. Um, so not only is it disrupting those natural processes, but it can also be toxic to people, so you can't swim or boat in lakes. Um, probably some of you have experienced that. You've gone to a beach later in the summer, and there's been an advisory because of some kind of toxic algae species in there. Has anyone seen this confluence where the St. Croix and the Mississippi come together? It's pretty dramatic. Um, it's a really great example of how land use really can affect our water. 
So the St. Croix River runs primarily through forested land. Not a lot of farming, not a lot of urbanization, and that forest is acting like a natural sponge. All those native plants are holding the soil in place. Versus the Mississippi River, which has come through some major urban areas and also some major agricultural areas, there is a lot of sediment in that water. Very clear difference. It takes miles before those, that brown and that clearer water start to combine and look like one river downstream. So all of this can sound a little dreary, but um, I love this cat photo. And um, there is a solution that fits this issue really neatly and perfectly and wonderfully, which is rain gardens. So a rain garden is just a regular garden, except that instead of building it on a flat bed, you're building it on a very shallow basin. So you're digging out a shallow basin, maybe just three to six inches deep, you're planting it with some deep-rooted plants. And as it rains, the water is directed there from your downspout, from your driveway. It fills that basin. And a berm or a raised section on one side is going to trap that water in place. You'll also loosen the soils underneath the basin to about 12 inches to give those plants a head start. So when the plants are young, you've already got some loosened soils there. And the plants will help those soils loosen more and more the longer they're there. So once it stops raining, plants will take up some of that water, and the water will also be able to slowly infiltrate in place rather than all rushing off to the storm drain all at once. You're basically just trapping that water in a planted area on your yard instead of letting it run straight into our storm water system. Here's a project we installed a few years ago. The water was collecting on the roof of the house, being directed down that downspout there. It popped out there, filled up that first basin. When the first basin filled, it would filter through the rocks and fill the second basin. In a really massive rainstorm, it would overflow and keep going to the street as normal. But they were able to capture, and except for maybe one or two enormous storms a year, they could capture the rainfall right there. So these rain gardens are designed. We want to make sure that they're going to be dry in 24 hours or less. Um, mosquitoes lay their eggs in water, and we do not want to create mosquito breeding grounds. But the, mos the mosquito eggs take three days to hatch. So as long as that water is gone within three days, the mosquito eggs are just going to die, and then we're actually like creating a death trap for mosquitoes <laughs> instead of a breeding ground for mosquitoes. We'll use those deep-rooted plants. We've got the soil microbes, which are naturally breaking down pollutants, filtering that water. It's replenishing our groundwater. And we designed these to be really beautiful, to match your landscaping, to meet your goals for your yard. And maybe help deal with some, some issues you're seeing in your yard already. Maybe you want to redirect water and get it away from a certain low spot. Here's a couple examples. This person was on a stormwater pond. They wanted to put in a planting here. The water was going straight out to the pond from their house. So they put in some edging. They put in mulch. It's hard to see, but there is a basin right there in the center. Again, pretty shallow. Once the mulch is in, you can hardly even tell there's a basin there. Directed the water right in. That's right after they put in their young baby plants. And there's the next summer. Kind of incredible. Um, so now you can see the house, the pond would be off to the left there. Here's another example, smaller project, but they wanted to capture that downspout you can see on the back left. So um, you don't usually want to put a basin right under a tree because trees have roots and they can be very hard to dig through, plus you could damage the tree. So they did the basin off to the front, kind of right side, but then extended the plants under the tree so it all looked like one cohesive project. So here they are doing the work, digging that out. And there it is right after they planted it. Um, and then one year later. So those plants grow up really quickly. They have some beautiful native cardinal flower there, which is that tall red flower that actually is really happy in the shade. So one of the, there's not a lot of examples of flowering plants that like shade, but cardinal flower is one of them. There we go. Um, these people were building a new house, so incorporated the landscaping right in there. 
this two-tiered garden. Water was heading out this way. They didn't want to pool the water in that top tier because that's really close to their foundation and the wall. So they added this second layer, and the water would fill up the basin on that lower level um, and soak in there into the ground. But it all ties in to the existing uh, planting by the house there. And there, again, you can see it's a mixture of native plants and non-native plants, um, different colors. They experimented with some different flower species there. One more project. They had an existing landscaping. They bumped it out. They added some native plants. And then there it is on year seven, still collecting water, still helping that water infiltrate, um, still doing great. One more example, right after planting. In this photo, you can see that berm on the front, that kind of speed bump trapping the water behind it so it doesn't just run straight out to the street. And then there it is the next summer. Again, a mixture of those tall native plants, native grasses, and then some cultivars as well because they liked those cultivars, wanted to add that color and that variety to their garden. So I have some data for you, so you don't just have to believe me that rain gardens are super good. I can prove it to you with some science. The city of Burnsville did um, an experiment a few years ago on Rushmore Drive. They picked these two neighborhoods that were the same size. They had their control neighborhood and their treatment neighborhood. And both of these neighborhoods, the whole street drained to one storm drain. So you can see those little red storm drains there. So they installed a device right in the storm drain that measured how much water was entering the drain after a rain event. And before they did anything, the, it was a very similar pattern. So you can see the green neighborhood and the red neighborhood, it's matching up pretty well. So whenever it rains, the same amount of water is leaving each neighborhood. Then they went in and installed 17 rain gardens in the treatment neighborhood. So not about 10 homes did not get a rain garden. 17 homes did get a rain garden. They put them in, they planted them with a mixture of native plants and cultivars. And then right away after installing them, when the plants had only been in for a couple weeks, they put those devices back in the storm drains and measured again for a few weeks. And we saw a very, very different pattern. So now that green neighborhood, which does not have any rain gardens, is still seeing a ton of water rushing into that storm drain. The red neighborhood is way down there at the bottom of the graph, an 85% reduction in the volume of water entering that storm drain. And that's right after they were installed. Those rain gardens are going to be able to soak up and infiltrate more and more water every year that they're there. And again, that wasn't 100% of people in the neighborhood putting in gardens. That was with about two-thirds of that street putting in rain gardens. And that's a huge difference there. One of the things I love about this program is that we see it happen all the time that someone will install a rain garden or a native garden. Their neighbors will walk by and they're like, what are you doing? What are those flowers? I don't know that. Why are you digging a hole in your yard? What's going on? And you can talk to them a little bit. We'll see neighbors telling their neighbors about what they're doing. And then we'll see those neighbors coming into the class the next summer and installing a project of their own. So it really starts to build and you see that growing impact neighborhood by neighborhood. So pretty awesome. This is that project there. So this is one of the front yard curb cut rain gardens Burnsville put in. Um, really pretty. So that's how rain gardens work. A neat little solution, keeping that water on your yard, letting it soak in. I'm going to talk about one final type of project, and I'll keep this briefer because shorelines affect fewer people. Um, but we probably all see or encounter shorelines on a semi-regular basis, being that we live in Minnesota, whether it's a very tiny pond or a big lake. So a native shoreline typically has some logs, some snags floating in the water. There's emergent vegetation like reeds poking out of the water. There's the stuff right along the shoreline, and all of that is providing erosion control, it's providing habitat, um, different fish and birds and insects can live in and on that stuff. So along shorelines, if you have ever been 
a kid running around or know some kids. You probably know there's lots of frogs by shores, uh, lots of cool bugs, lots of dragonflies, butterflies like to be on shorelines. Um, and all of that grass right there is keeping the shore in place. Those roots are holding that soil there. So this is a striking example of what happens when you mow your grass right down to the water's edge. That back lot there where the person is standing, they left tall grass on the shoreline there. These people in the foreground mowed it short right down to the edge of the water. They used to have the same shoreline. In just a couple years, they lost all of that shorefront property because there were no roots holding the soil and the sand in place. One of my coworkers has a theory that actually the flamingos destroyed it all. <laughs> you can choose which theory you want to go with. Um, a lot of soil loss there. And people often think about shorelines, especially when it's a residential shoreline, um, as wanting to mirror what our cities look like. And they want to have that curb line and that nice, neat, straight line. So people will try to mimic that and have these nice, straight edges, clean edges with shorelines. Um, or they'll try creative ways to kind of shore things up and prevent erosion, which is good, right? We've got some riprap here preventing erosion. You can get really creative with your erosion protection. Use what you've got, right? But things like this, sure, they might be preventing some erosion, but they're not providing a lot of great habitat, maybe, for wildlife, for pollinators. Um, along our shorelines, whether it's residential or parkland, we're seeing a drop in tree canopy, a drop in shrub cover. Uh, we're also seeing fewer of our native endangered songbirds and more and more of the common birds like Canada geese and crows um, that are very common, not endangered species. Um, and then by the time you get to a density of 30 homes per mile, it's impossible for frogs to live there. So dense development on shorelines really cuts down in amphibian habitat as well. So the challenge is how to take a shoreline that's eroding, that looks kind of gross, that's prime habitat for Canada geese, and turn it into something that provides more habitat than this, that's functioning like our native shoreline, but is still usable, still attractive, still gives us access to the water. Um, if you're by the water, if you bought shoreline property, or if you live near a shoreline park, you probably want to be able to enjoy and see that water. So we um, can help people design projects, and we often work with parks as well to think about even bigger shoreline projects, but we also work with people that live on stormwater ponds or lakes. Um, this is one project we did in West St. Paul, uh, Thompson Lake. You can see the bank is severely eroding there. It's getting cut out. You can also see there are a lot of Canada geese who love wide open spaces. If there are plants that are taller than a goose, the goose will not hang out there because they're afraid that there might be a predator behind the tall plant. So if you plant things that are taller than a goose, you'll deal with your goose problem. So lots of geese here, but they went in, they put in an erosion control blanket made totally out of natural coconut fibers, a bio log right along the water's edge, and that uh, helps break up the force of waves and moving water to protect the plants when they're still young. And both that biolog and the erosion control blanket, because they're made entirely out of natural fibers, they're going to degrade and decompose over time and just disappear over time as the plants get bigger and don't need their protection anymore. So into that erosion control blanket, they put in all of these little plugs, so little tiny baby plants. Um, and then around the planting, they have their... Uh, very important goose exclusion fence all around the planting there. Uh, they didn't put that in at first, and the geese came in, I hear, and pulled each plug out of each hole um, and laid them next to the holes, um, which, because geese can just be jerks sometimes. So they had to replant everything, put the fence back up, um, and then they, they had success with it. So that's what it looked like the next year. Plants grow up, green up. They had lots of green stuff with deep roots that likes wet feet right along the shoreline. And then up on top of the hill there, which is where people are walking through that park, they had more flowering plants. 
So you've got a nice view as you look out to the lake with some nice flowering plants that are providing food and habitat for pollinators. Here's another example in Birdsville. Again, an eroding shoreline. Same kind of techniques with that blanket, the biolog planting right into the blanket. And that's right after planting. That's just two months after planting. Those things are greening up really quickly. Final project, some severe erosion happening on this slope. Um, so we actually reconstructed, regraded, added some more soil. We used live stakes from shrubs to actually hold that blanket in place. And that will regrow into shrubs. So that's what it looked like right after planting. And that's when it started to green up just a couple months later. So we include some kind of cover crop that grows really quickly. And that will help uh, prevent erosion immediately. And then there's also some longer growing plugs and flowering plants in there that take a little bit longer to reach full maturity. So a lot of different things we can do with shorelines. Shorelines can get kind of complex and unique, but there's always ways to um, create those native benefits while also looking really attractive on our waterways. Um, and making things beautiful is important to us. Um, we care about water quality and healthy soil and pollinators, but we also want it to be really beautiful um, because, you know, beauty is, has value in and of itself. And because we also know that the more people love and appreciate their gardens, the longer they will take care of them and the longer they'll last and keep providing those benefits. So there's lots of different ways your garden can look. Some people like straight edges. Some people like curvy edges. Some people like tall plants because they are sick of staring at their neighbors and they just want to filter that view a little bit. Lots of great native shrubs for that. Maybe you want to filter a view of this algae pond, put some beautiful native wildflowers in the foreground that are going to help deal with that algae problem over time also. Um, often people, this was a homeowners association, so they did this big shared project among several homes. And they grouped things together, big clusters. Um, one of the reasons is that it's easier for pollinators to find things when it's in a big cluster, because it's a nice big block of color, it's a big burst of smell, very easy for pollinators to find it. It also, though, makes weeding a lot easier. So in the spring, especially if you're sharing the weeding among multiple families who aren't all familiar with the planting plan, if you go in and you look at the ground and you see, oh, there's 10 things that all look the same and then one thing that looks different right in the middle, that one random thing I'm probably going to pull out. Um, so it's easier to see what's supposed to be there, what's not supposed to be there. Some plants also just have a more dramatic appeal when they're clustered together. So this little plant is called prairie smoke. It's a really beautiful native flower. It's just about a foot tall. One plant on its own, easy to miss. But when you've got a big bunch of them together, it's this beautiful burst of pink in the spring. We really encourage that people use available materials, too. You don't have to go out and buy all new stuff. It's pretty easy to find free rock around that you can use as your edging or used to make a dry creek bed to direct water into your garden. Um, often you can find uh, free things on Craigslist and things like that. And often you can get free plants from your neighbors that are growing native plants, because over time, their perennials will need to be divided and um, shared with the people around you. Dry creek beds can be a really beautiful way to get water from your downspout to your garden. It's a little bit more work because you have to place all of those stones in your dry creek bed. But then when it rains, that dry creek bed is going to fill with water that's getting directed right to your rain garden rather than out to the street. To make the water go where you want it to go. So I've just said a lot of information. I've been talking for a while. You guys are probably um, done hearing me talk. But if you guys are interested in continuing with a project of your own, Next steps after hearing this intro, oh, and this is just a great sign. <laughs> I'm excited for spring. Um, so the next step is if you really want to dig into a specific project on your property is to sign up for a design course. That's where you will work one-on-one -on -one with uh, professionals from our staff, with master gardener and master water steward volunteers, with city staff. Um, as part of attending the class, you get personalized maps of your property with contour lines, aerial photography, 
measurements, other resources. You get the, this really excellent uh, blue thumb guide for rain gardens, which also contains an awesome plant guide, plant list in there. Um, and then attending the design course is a prerequisite to um, applying for a grant. So you'll gain access to that grant, that technical assistance. There is a $25 fee per project or per property for the design course. Um, if the fee is an issue for anyone, you can always talk to our office. Um, but that just helps cover part of our costs for putting on the design course. So for people here tonight, you can sign up for the design course in person. You can sign up for the design course via phone or email. Um, and you can sign up by just stopping by our office in Farmington. Dates change every year. You get your maps in the mail. Um, and then you can also request a shoreline assistance worksheet for anyone that's interested in doing a shoreline project. We've got a special funding for that. We also, for people that live in any of these cities, so the city of Apple Valley, Burnsville, and the city of South St. Paul also have additional grants. So you can layer those grants on top of our $250 grant and potentially get an additional $500 or $1,000 towards your project, which is great. So um, we are not the distributors of those grants. So if you're interested, I would contact the city staff at that city um, and ask your specific questions about how to apply for those. You can follow us. We've got lots of beautiful garden pictures. I think they're beautiful on um, our Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. Um, and I really just want to thank you all for coming, for being interested in clean water, pollinators, native plants, all of that good stuff. Um, it's great to see you all tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you.